Okay, so I guess we can get started. Um, hi all, and welcome to the sixth lecture of our series on, um, on radio astronomy. In this case, continuing from yesterday, space-based radio astronomy particularly. Um, tonight, Dr. Mary Knapp is with us to speak about a couple of projects at Haystack and in general where the field is going. Um, Dr. Mary Knapp graduated with a degree in Earth Atmospheric, PhD degree in Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences last year, was previously um, treasurer of the Radio Society, and has now pro a project scientist on the Asteria project at Haystack, which is an experimental CubeSat mission to basically prove out a bunch of the concepts that are going to be talked about here. Her interests in general involve um, space-based radio astronomy research, CubeSat missions and instrumentation design, and um, her PhD research was actually on interferometry for detection of exoplanets. Now, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mary Knapp. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you all for being here and everyone on the uh, live stream as well. Um, this has been a really great series so far, and I'm very pleased uh, that I was invited to be a part of it. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Okay, I'll try to, try to project. So my talk this evening is on the very lowest frequency end of the radio spectrum uh, and the radio sky at those low frequencies. So uh, my cover slide here is a view of the radio sky. If you had uh, eyes that worked at radio wavelengths, this is what you would see when you looked up at the night sky. And at first glance, it doesn't look that different from what you actually see when you go out and look up at the sky, right? There's points of light and some fuzzier, bigger things, right? The difference is almost every one of these points of light is not a star, but it's a galaxy. So in, radio, uh, in, in the radio sky, you primarily see galaxies. Uh, you see emission from the center of galaxies where supermassive black holes are streaming out jets of material uh, at relativistic speeds. Uh, there's also a few things in here like supernova remnants that are actually within our galaxy. But most of the things you see in the radio sky are other galaxies and not nearby objects. So to put this talk in the context of the other ones from this series, this is a nice slide that uh, Phil Erickson made to uh, show where all these talks fit within the signal chain. Um, I'm over here. Uh, I'm going to be talking primarily about data post-telescope, post-antenna. I'm not going to get much into signal processing details. Uh, you heard a bit about that actually yesterday from Alan Rogers. All right, I'm going to address three points in this talk. First, what is the last unexplored window of the electromagnetic spectrum? Spoiler, it is low frequency radio. What does that part, what does the sky look like or what do we think the sky looks like in this last window of the spectrum that we don't understand very well? And finally, what do we need to do? What kind of instruments do we need to build in order to uh, explore this final frontier, to see the world, uh, to see the universe in low frequency radio waves? So let's start just by looking at the full electromagnetic spectrum, right? So at the very highest energy end, we have gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, uh, and luckily for Earthlings, our atmosphere blocks those uh, types of radiation from reaching the surface of the Earth. So this is atmospheric opacity as a function of um, wavelength here. So the high frequency end, uh, we can't see anything coming in because the atmosphere blocks it and protects us from uh, very high energy radiation, so that's good. Here's the visible window, the tiny bit of the spectrum that we can actually see with our eyes without any help. So that comes all the way down through the atmosphere so we can see things around us. Then moving into the infrared portion of the spectrum, there are some windows that are clear and infrared radiation can come down and we can measure it uh, on the ground. There's big chunks of the spectrum that are wiped out by constituents of the atmosphere, uh, water vapor being a primary one. And then there's this big radio window, which is why uh, radio astronomy exists in, on, uh, on the ground. That's why we can build radio telescopes and look up at the universe and make images like the one that was on my cover slide. And then over here, at the very longest wavelengths, the lowest frequencies, 
uh, down here, uh, meters to kilometer scale wavelengths. Again, we have an opaque atmosphere. And in this case, the opacity is due to the Earth's ionosphere, uh, the ionized portion of the upper atmosphere where electrons are stripped from uh, atomic nuclei and we have a plasma. Uh, Phil Erickson talked quite a bit about the ionosphere and propagation issues uh, in the ionosphere in his talk on Friday. So if you recall that or, or you can watch it on the YouTube channel, um, he'll go, he goes into more detail than I will in this talk. Uh, and, uh, and Thea Koster on Tuesday, right? And Thea's on Tuesday? Um, Monday. Monday. Um, and Thea Koster on Monday will talk in, in much more detail about uh, the ionosphere, how we measure it, um, what it does on a daily and weekly and yearly basis, and, and so on. So this is the window that we're going to be talking about this evening. So let's take a look at the universe across these uh, various bands. Here's visible light. For the vast majority of human history, this is all we could see. We could go outside at night look up at the sky, and this is what our galaxy looks like. Um, you can see that there's, it's definitely brighter in this band across the center, uh, the galactic plane. Um, the center, though, is shrouded by these dust clouds. So you really can't see all the way straight to the center of our galaxy. There's stuff in the way that's dark in, in visible wavelengths. As we developed uh, detectors that could measure infrared wavelengths, um, so longer wavelengths than visible light, we we're able to see the galaxy in a whole new way. So in near-infrared, that dust suddenly becomes transparent. You see right through it to this very bright core of the galaxy. Um, and you see, uh, this is a, I think this is probably a spectral line image, and this is uh, farther into the infrared. So same general structure, right? There's a band and a lumpy bright thing in the middle. But the details change a little bit. You can see different parts in a way that you couldn't in strictly visible light. Um, and as if you can recall from the previous slide, there are some windows of the infrared portion of the spectrum that you can't access from the ground. So in order to observe those windows, you need to put uh, telescopes in space. We go to longer wavelengths still, to uh, this is the molecular hydrogen line, and this is the radio continuum at 2.5 gigahertz. Um, these images look different still. Now, you mostly see the, the plane of the galaxy as a narrow slice here. It doesn't look so big and lumpy as it does in infrared and optical. Um, so yet another view of the galaxy. There's also these things coming <coughs> up from the plane. Uh, some of those are near field supernova remnant type things. Um, some are bits of spiral arm. You can go even deeper into the radio. Um, so this is molecular hydrogen, this is the atomic hydrogen view, uh, and this is the um, UHF view of the radio <coughs> sky, 408 megahertz. So ground-based telescopes can observe all of this because all of those uh, wavelengths are in the clear radio window uh, where radio waves can get all the way down to the ground. Going to the high energy end of the spectrum, here's um, X-ray. Now that looks really different. Suddenly you don't have such a clear galactic plane. Instead you have bright pieces of stuff all over the place. So um, let's see, these are probably uh, supernova remnants. Um, I'm not a high energy <laughs> astronomer, so you should ask one of, one of them what exactly is going on in the X-ray part of the spectrum. We can go all the way down to gamma rays, the, the highest energy radiation uh, that comes from extremely energetic events, uh, supernovas. Um, accretion of matter onto black holes, things like that. So in gamma rays, actually, you, you recover the disk of the galaxy a little bit, where you didn't see it so much in x-ray. And there's a few extremely bright point sources. Um, so with our telescopes, both in space and on the ground, and these have to be in space, as we described a moment ago, we have a full range of views on our galaxy. Uh, and on the uh, environment beyond our galaxy. And we can learn a lot about the physical processes that are happening in our galaxy and in other galaxies by comparing what objects look like at different wavelengths. Any reason the 408 megahertz and the gamma ray look extremely similar? Yes. For reasons that I, I 
won't get into now, uh, but we can certainly talk about after in the Q&A. <coughs> but yes, there, there's a strong connection between uh, radio emission and high energy emission like gamma ray and x-ray. But, so I've, I've been expanding this bar that's showing the part of the spectrum that we're able to observe. But what about up here, right? From uh, the HF band, for those of you who are, uh, who are hams, all the way through um, VLF and ELF, extreme low frequency, very long wavelengths, kilometer plus scale wavelengths. Where's the picture of the galaxy there? Well, at the moment we don't have one. And the reason for that is the ionosphere. So the ionosphere is a plasma. Um, plasma is a mess of charged particles moving around influenced by magnetic fields. Uh, plasmas have a fundamental frequency at which they can react to forcing. Uh, it's sort of a, a resonant frequency, if you like. Um, and it's set by primarily uh, by the number density of electrons in the plasma. So uh, the, the plasma frequency is, is basically nine times the uh, number density of the plasma, uh, the square root of the number density of the plasma. Uh, so if you have an electromagnetic wave that is impinging on a plasma, and the frequency of that electromagnetic wave is below the plasma frequency, that wave will not propagate through the plasma. It won't get through. It'll be absorbed, it'll be reflected, uh, so, or some combination of those two. Uh, and you can think of that as um, electrons in the plasma are able to move at the plasma frequency and no faster. So if the plasma frequency is faster than the impinging electromagnetic wave's frequency, the plasma can compensate for the electric portion of that uh, EM wave and screen it out block it. Um, the electrons are able to move fast enough that they compensate for the electric field. So if you have electromagnetic radiation that is uh, below the Earth's ionospheric plasma frequency, it will not make it to the ground. And Phil on Friday talked about how this is beneficial if you're trying to do communications over long distances. HF uh, communications will bounce right off the ionosphere and bounce around the world. And then you can talk to people that are way over the horizon. So that's great for communications, terrible for radio astronomy. So this is a diagram of the plasma density in the Earth's ionosphere and plasmosphere. So this is electron density um, in units of uh, electron per <coughs> centimeters cubed. And this is radial distance from the Earth in Earth radii. So this is the surface of the Earth here at one Earth radii, right? So the ionosphere peaks in density, <coughs> fairly low, a few hundred kilometers, and then it falls off, and you get to the plasma pause, it falls off further. This is the magnetospheric cavity. I'm gonna show an image of this in a moment. Um, and then you get out to the solar wind, way up here, uh, way far away from the Earth. So these colored bars give you a order of magnitude sense of what the plasma frequency is at these different electron densities. So under very uh, disturbed conditions, the plasma frequency of, uh, of the ionospheric peak can be tens of megahertz. Uh, right now, the sun is quiet. There's not as much forcing uh, and ionization. So typically, it's a few megahertz in, under quiet conditions. Uh, and as you move out into the solar wind, the plasma frequency goes all the way down to tens of kilohertz. So Sitting on the surface, you can't see anything coming in with a frequency below this. But if you're up here, out of the peak of the ionosphere in the magnetospheric cavity or even beyond the Earth's magnetosphere entirely, then you can see much lower frequency radiation. Those units are kilohertz? Yeah, uh, these are megahertz. Megahertz, but on the other end? Yes, I switch units right here. Okay. All right, so clearly you have to go to space. Have we sent anything to space to explore this part of the spectrum? Yes, in fact, we have. In the 70s, there was a mission called uh, Radio Astronomy Explorer 1 and 2, so we're gonna focus on two. Uh, the first one was put into Earth orbit, and it turns out there was so much man-made emission from Earth that it didn't see anything astronomical. 
So the second one, they sent out to the moon uh, to <coughs> get farther away from the Earth, take advantage of the one over R squared fall off of uh, man-made interference, <coughs> and actually get a look at the radio sky. This is a, a diagram of that spacecraft. It had a bunch of long dipoles on it to do the measurement. Um, and this is the map that it made. So here we have um, declination <coughs> versus right ascension. So that's basically latitude and longitude, uh, just sort of projected out onto the sky, approximately. So, and, and this curve here is the galactic plane, all right? Same here. So this is 3.93 megahertz. This is 6.55 megahertz. These are two of the bands that um, RAE2 used. <coughs> Not much of a map. Not like those beautiful images that we saw from various space and ground-based telescopes. There's clearly some uh, increased emission in you know, this region here and <coughs> decreased emission over here. You can kind of see it follows the galactic plane-ish. The resolution on this, this map is something like 60 degrees, right? whereas our resolution on optical maps of the universe is arc seconds. So it's not much of a view of the, the universe. <coughs> it's better than nothing, so it's what we've got, but it, it isn't <coughs> that impressive. This is the same map in galactic coordinates. So um, this is galactic uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, as you can see, there's you know, maybe some enhancement in the middle, probably. Uh, so that's what we've got. Another interesting measurement that RA2 made was looking at what is the emission coming from the Earth, uh, primarily terrestrial like, man-made interference. So this plot is time versus basically uh, amplitude on various uh, bands. So this is 13 megahertz, 11, 6, 3, uh, 400, uh, about 500 kilohertz down to 250 kilohertz. Um, <coughs> so you can see as RE is going around in its orbit of the moon, there's some measurement and then boom, it drops out. What happened here is it, it went into the shadow of the moon. So the spacecraft went behind the moon <coughs> so that the moon was between the spacecraft and the Earth. And the amplitude <coughs> in all these bands dropped. So clearly, there's a lot of noise coming from the Earth. <coughs> which if you think about it for a second, it's kind of surprising, right? I just told you that the Earth's uh, ionospheric plasma frequency tends to be in the tens to single digit megahertz, right? Well, this is... 13 megahertz, this is 11, and then we're below 10. What, where's this coming from? It shouldn't propagate out from the Earth, right? That's what plasma physics tells you. And yet, it does. So clearly the ionosphere is a lot more complicated than a simple sheet of plasma that sits over the Earth. Um, there's a lot of structure in the ionosphere, and there are pathways uh, that kind of act like waveguides in some cases where lower frequency uh, radio emission from terrestrial sources can get out. Uh, there's also natural radio emission from the Earth uh, that's coming from higher up, uh, and of course that gets out as well, but I'll discuss <coughs> that in a, in a moment. But this is, a, this is a really important observation in the history of low frequency radio astronomy because it indicated to people that if you want to make maps of the universe at low frequencies, you better put something between yourself and the Earth, because the Earth is loud. Right? So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay. We can't see much of the universe <coughs> at these frequencies. Is there any reason we should bother to try to see the universe more clearly at low frequencies? What's out there to see? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of answers to that question, depending on what kind of uh, radio astronomer you're talking to. You happen to be talking to an exoplanet person, um, so I'm going to talk about radio emission from planets. Uh, I'll touch briefly on other uh, science cases at low frequencies towards the end of this section. So Phil described in some detail solar weather and how that moves from the sun and impinges on the earth and causes all sorts of interesting propagation things to change in the ionosphere. So here's, a, here's the cartoon, not to scale, right? Um, the, the sun is pumping out charged particles. The solar wind flows off the sun. Um, it's, a, it's a low density, high temperature plasma, uh, uh, as Phil <coughs> mentioned. 
and it has embedded in it the magnetic field of the sun. So the solar wind is a magnetized plasma flowing off the sun out into interplanetary space. And when it gets to a planet, it runs into an obstacle. Um, and in fact, the solar wind is uh, supersonic or super magnetosonic when it reaches the Earth. So when it runs into that obstacle, you end up with a shock. So there's a shock <coughs> here. Uh, and then there's a cavity behind the shock, and then all sorts of complicated interactions happen between the magnetic field of the sun from the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field, which is roughly a dipole. Uh, one of those effects is that the night side of the magnetosphere gets stretched way out into sort of a, a long teardrop-shaped tail. Uh, so, <coughs> Phil touched on this briefly, but where does this dipolar field come from? It comes from the Earth's uh, outer core. So the Earth has the crust that we live on. Underneath is a mantle, which is hot but solid uh, rock. And below the mantle is the iron core of the Earth. And the core has two layers. There's a liquid outer core that is composed of liquid iron. And then there's a solid inner core that's composed of solid iron and nickel. Um, so in that liquid outer core, that it's a ferrofluid, right? It's liquid iron. Uh, that core is convecting and the Earth is turning. And so the, com the combination of vigorous convection in the outer core and a little bit of a twist gives you this sort of helical flow in the core, and that drives a dynamo. Um, the magnetic field of the Earth is actually very complex and messy right at the boundary between the, the outer core and the mantle. But uh, as that magnetic field propagates up through the mantle and out of the Earth into space, um, the, the dipole term falls off least quickly. Uh, if you, spherical harmonics, who's, who's worked with spherical, yeah. So the, the dipole term falls off least quickly and that's what you end up <coughs> seeing uh, outside where we are. There are still um, low levels of other components, quadrupoles, octopoles, uh, but the primary component uh, is, the, <coughs> is the dipole and that's what we see. All right. So we know the Earth has a magnetic field because we're sitting on it, and we can take out our compass and it points north. Uh, and of course, you can fly a spacecraft and you can measure the magnetic field uh, in great detail for the Earth. What about other planets? Um, for quite a long time, we didn't know if other planets had mag magnetic fields like the Earth. Uh, in the in the fifties, though, there was uh, there was a experiment to look at Jupiter and see whether there was any radio emission coming from Jupiter. Uh, this is uh, Bernie Burke and Franklin. Bernie Burke was uh, an MIT emeritus faculty for, for quite a long time and unfortunately has, has passed away. But in, uh, in 1955, uh, at, I think this was at about 20 megahertz, there were detections of pulses of radio emission coming from Jupiter, regular pulses spikes in these uh, chart recorder charts coming from the direction of Jupiter. And um, after recording this for some time and thinking about what it could be, uh, it was determined that these pulses came from interactions between Jupiter's magnetic field and solar wind. And these pulses were indicative of a process in the plasma above Jupiter uh, emitting coherent radiation. <coughs> Sorry, I keep skipping ahead. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a plasma physics process called uh, cyclotron emission, where electrons spiral around magnetic field lines really, really fast, and through some complicated plasma physics I'm not going to get into right now, they end up converting some of their energy into electromagnetic radiation. And the frequency of that electromagnetic radiation is, uh, is given by this equation. So cyclotron frequency is basically proportional to the magnetic field uh, that those electrons are experiencing. Uh, with some constants. So if you can measure emission that you believe is cyclotron driven, you have a direct measurement of the magnetic field uh, that in the region where that emission originates. So by looking at uh, the pulses from Jupiter and measuring their frequency spectrum, uh, Burke and Franklin were able to determine that Jupiter has a magnetic field and its strength at the emission region was uh, something like 10 Gauss, which is actually quite accurate. So 
able to measure the magnetic field of Jupiter from a ground-based telescope before, long before we sent spacecraft there. So that's Jupiter. What about the other planets? Well, in that case, it took a space mission before we were able to measure magnetic fields for the remaining planets in our solar system. So this is data from Voyager 2, uh, the only spacecraft to visit um, the four gas giants in our solar system. And this is frequency, and this is uh, flux density. Uh, pause here, sorry. The units here are Jansky. Who is familiar with Jansky as a unit of flow? Okay. <laughs> Jansky is a radio astronomer's unit. Um, it is 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. So it's a very small unit. It's a very small quantity of uh, spectral energy. But most radio sources in the universe are actually quite faint. And so we measure in Jansky because it gives us round numbers like 10 Jansky or 1 Jansky. Um, so this is watts per square meter per hertz. I put Jansky on the, on the scale so you can get a sense of um, what that is. Uh, all of these values uh, are normalized as if the spacecraft was sitting um, one AU from the emitting body. So of course Voyager 2 was flying by Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, Uranus, and then Neptune. So the distance was changing as a function of time as it made these recordings. But the data has been normalized so that it's as if all of the planets are sitting at the same distance. So here's Jupiter. Um, this curve here. <coughs> There's a, a bunch of notations that represent different components of the radio emission of Jupiter that I'll discuss in a moment. <coughs> this spectrum is Jupiter's radio emission. You can see it goes up to several tens of uh, megahertz, which is why we're able to detect it from the ground. Here's Saturn, right? Saturn's radio emission cuts off at about one megahertz, which is why it was not detected from the ground. Same story for um, Uranus and Neptune and for the Earth. This is uh, TKR, terrestrial kilometric radiation, and uh, much like Uranus and Neptune and Saturn, it cuts off about at a megahertz. So we can't measure Earth's own radio emission from the ground. It doesn't get through. Um, I'm gonna talk more in more detail about where this radio emission comes <coughs> from and what it means and what we can learn for it, from it. But let's take a break and watch a cool video. All right. This is, a, this is a spectrogram. So this is time versus frequency. And you can see there's tens of kilohertz here. Let's just listen for a second. than you could get, a, get uh, a sense for in those simple frequency versus intensity line plots, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. It's a complex emission. This is the Earth, as observed by the cluster spacecraft. Uh, again, time versus frequency. terrestrial uh, auroral emission. So this is coming from, uh, one second, this is coming from the auroral zones uh, of the Earth and uh, as I said can only be observed by spacecraft because it does not penetrate through the ionosphere for us to observe from the ground. Yes. Uh, how is this? Go ahead. How is this demodulated to, to some kind of audible frequency? Because that was 256 kilohertz on the y-axis. Yeah, it's, it's just downshifted. 
and like okay. played through a speaker. Um, okay. Obviously, uh, you can't hear that. It, it's electromagnetic radiation, not sound. But for fun, uh, it was downshifted into the audible regime, so you could actually listen to it. Same question, but one more detail. It's not downshifted in the same way that an upper sideband receiver does, because then you'd only have. Did you just rescale the frequency and then convert back to time domain? I believe that's how they do it. Okay. Um, this is a group in the uh, University of Iowa that uh, makes movies like this. Um, and I believe that's what they do. They rescale and, and shift down. Um, and what was with the two different plots on the previous slide? I think that was two different spacecraft. Okay. Uh, cluster is a multi spacecraft. Like it was playing both at the same time. I didn't know what that was. It's probably just audio from one. Okay. Um, I encourage you to check out this website. There's lots more of these videos, and they have more detailed explanations than I have time to get into. Uh, really cool stuff. Um, and I, was there one more? Yes. Uh, how do you know that the emission, or what's recorded is really an emission from Earth or something as opposed to it being reflected from another source? That's a really good question. Um, the way that radio astronomers and geoscience people identify uh, different types of natural radio emission is usually by their spectral shape and usually um, there's a physical reason for something to have a particular spectral shape. Um, there's also the fact that if something is coming from far away being reflected back at you, you're, it's attenuated by one over r to the fourth. Um, so I suppose it, it's, it's difficult to say with 100% certainty that there's nothing reflected from somewhere else here, but given the spectral shape and given the intensity, this stuff is bright. Uh, the, the most reasonable explanation is that it is directly coming from the upper ionosphere to the spacecraft. <coughs> All right, last one, and my favorite. Um, these are whistlers. <coughs> whistlers are uh, kind of like the echo of lightning in radio waves. Uh, lightning um, actually can propagate not just down, but up, and you end up with trapped uh, oscillations that move along the magnetic field lines. Er, whistlers. That was fun. Back to science. All right. These are fun. These are pretty. So what? What do they mean? What can we learn from them? Where's the, where's the physics? Um, there's a number of things that we can learn about a planet by looking at its radio emission. The first is we can determine the magnetic field at the location where this emission is, is coming from. As I uh, said a few slides ago, this is cyclotron emission. Um, so the frequency of emission is directly proportional, or rather the cutoff frequency, the highest frequency, is directly proportional to B, to the magnetic field. So that's why we could, uh, uh, Burke and Franklin could look at Jupiter, measure the peak of its radio emission, and say, ah, we know its magnetic field strength, at least at, at, at one location. Next, you can measure rotation period. So as I said, uh, Burke and Franklin observed regular pulses from Jupiter, right? Uh, a spike, nothing, a spike, nothing. What that was was an emitting region coming around and going away as Jupiter was rotating. And you can see that illustrated here. Because of the, the physics of how cyclotron emission is generated in planetary magnetospheres, you end up with this big, wide, um, hollow cone of radio emission. So it's like a lighthouse. The cone sweeps over you and you see a burst and then it sweeps away and you see nothing. So if you measure that for long enough, you can measure the rotation period of a planet. Uh, in fact, the rotation periods that are canonical for all of the gas giants come from this. Um, it's not from looking at the planets rotate because clouds are going in different directions and there's jets and it's a mess. This gives you the true rotation period of the planet and that's how we measure the gas giants rotation. Uh, Third, you can learn something about the interaction between the planet and the solar wind or stellar wind, if we're going to talk about exoplanets, which we are. 
um, the power for this radio mission, at least at Earth and to a lesser extent at, at the outer planets, comes from the solar wind. That's the power source that uh, puts energy into the system. It gets moved around via the planetary field lines and eventually uh, electrons are accelerated and then they emit uh, electromagnetic waves and that's what we observe. So by looking at variations in the strength and frequency of uh, radio emission from planets, you can get a sense for what the stellar wind is doing, particularly at Earth. And finally, you can determine if a planet has moons. So for Jupiter, uh, Jupiter has this moon called Io that is um, tidally uh, squeezed uh, and is very uh, geologically active. There are many volcanoes on Io. And Io is a little tiny moon, so as these volcanoes are erupting, a lot of the material that's erupted escapes. It achieves escape velocity and it goes off and becomes a plasma in Jupiter's magnetosphere. Um, and that plasma uh, feeds emission like this. It's like, a, it's like a additional power source aside from the solar wind. Um, so if you look for modulation in the periodicity of radio emission that's different from the rotation period, then you can infer the presence of moons. And in fact, there's a very clear signature in Jovian radio emission that corresponds to the period of Io, and slightly harder to find signatures that correspond to the um, orbital periods of Europa and Ganymede. So the three of the four Galilean satellites have clear signatures in Jovian radio emission in the time domain. So there's a lot of information uh, packed into this low frequency radio emission. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we can't see most of it from the ground. We had Voyager 2 that went out and made these measurements for solar system objects, um, but kind of limited. And uh, Cassini and, and Galileo and now Juno are making similar measurements at Jupiter and Saturn. Um, oops, seems to want to skip ahead. There we go. Um, so mostly, planetary radio emission in this solar system is below Earth's ionosphere cutoff, which is rather unfortunate. Um, seems to want to skip ahead here. All right. Stay still. So if we're interested in exoplanets, this seems like potentially a good way to find exoplanets, right? This bright radio emission corresponds to planets with uh, magnetic fields. What about the star? Is it going to be difficult to see planetary emission next to a bright star? In optical, uh, the contrast ratio between a planet like the Earth and a star is 10 to the 10. So that is very hard to overcome. That's a firefly next to a huge lighthouse, right? In the radio, though, is a very different regime. So this is a messy plot. Don't worry about most of the stuff on it. But we're looking at spectra again here. So this is frequency, and this is flux density in Jansky, the astronomer's unit. Um, so here is the radio spectrum for the quiet sun. Right? The quiet sun sort of drops off as you get to tens and single digit megahertz. Right? Right here. Here's Jupiter. Jupiter outshines the quiet sun by orders of magnitude. Jupiter is very, very bright in radio. Um, the other planets are, are also bright, although Jupiter really takes the cake. So, uh, and then, then the, the active sun is up here. So when the sun is active, it jumps up in radio emission by several orders of magnitude, and it's on par with Jupiter or a little bit brighter. So contrast ratio here is like one or better. So that's great for exoplanets, right? It's a lot easier to see uh, a one-to-one -one set of bright things than something that's 10 to 10 times <coughs> brighter than this little thing over here. So, have we seen any exoplanets? I am sad to report, no, we have not detected exoplanets in uh, low frequency radio as yet. One might think that you know, Jupiter is visible from the ground. Some exoplanets are like Jupiter or even bigger. So it's not unreasonable to think that we might be able to detect exoplanets using ground-based telescopes. In fact, that was the basis for my thesis, so I obviously did not think it was unreasonable when I started. Um, but it has not happened yet. We have not yet made an unambiguous detection of radio emission from an exoplanet. Um, 
there's lots of potential reasons for that. Uh, most likely, our ground-based instruments just don't have the sensitivity yet to make a detection. 1 over r squared really is not your friend when you're looking at things that are uh, many light years away. Um, so even something that is as blazingly bright as Jupiter diminishes very fast when you take it out to many parsecs. So if, Jupiter, if there was a Jupiter around Alpha Centauri, which there is not, we know this for sure, but if there was, um, it would have a, a flux density at, in about 100 millijansky, um, let's say at 30 megahertz. <coughs> so that would be detectable from the ground, right? But kind of just barely with current instruments. So if you go out to five parsecs where there's only sort of a handful of stars, there's not that many sort of opportunities uh, for there to be a planet that we could detect with the sensitivity of current instruments. And don't forget that only one out of the uh, five planets in the solar system with strong magnetic fields is detectable from the ground. So it's entirely possible that if we're able to go to space and observe at lower frequencies than our, than our uh, achievable from the ground, we might find a whole bunch of exoplanets. Um, so that's, that's for the future. Um, there, the people have argued, and uh, probably rightly so, that just taking Jupiter and scaling it uh, by distance to nearby stars is maybe not, maybe not fair. Maybe there's ways to enhance radio emission beyond what uh, our Jupiter has. Of course, there are hot Jupiter exoplanets, right? Planets the size of Jupiter that orbit inside the uh, orbit of Mercury uh, compared to our solar system. That's a really extreme system. What if you took Jupiter and you shoved it in that close to the sun? What would its radio emission look like? Well, we think it would really boost the radio emission from a planet like Jupiter if it was closer to the star because the impinging solar or stellar wind is a lot stronger. There's a lot more energy being collected on the magnetosphere that could be radiated out uh, as uh, cyclotron emission. So this is, this is the scaling law. Astronomers like to make plots of uh, log log and put some dots on it and draw a line through them, right? That's, <laughs> that's fair. Um, and if you look at solar system planets, you look at the in, uh, impinging solar wind power and their radial luminosity as measured uh, mostly by Voyager, you can draw a line that says the more solar wind power they collect, the brighter they are. So if you extend that for planets that are orbiting really close to their star, they ought to be really bright. And yet, we still haven't seen them. So maybe there's something we still don't understand about how this works. Um, so I'm going to leave it there uh, for exoplanets. Happy to take questions at the end about that. I want to briefly mention some other applications for low-frequency uh, radio observations. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ones is heliophysics, studying our own star, right? I showed you a plot with uh, different spectral shapes for the sun when it was quiet versus when it's active. Um, there's a lot going on in the solar radio spectrum, too. Uh, there's these things called coronal mass ejections, where uh, a loop of flux, a loop of plasma contained by a magnetic field uh, reconfigures itself, pinches off, and then the, the, the pinched off loop shoots towards the outer solar system, right? It's accelerated away from the sun. A uh, big gob of plasma with its own internal magnetic field goes blazing off at hundreds of kilometers per second uh, into the solar system and sometimes runs into the Earth. These things, as they're propagating out, they reach a point where they are going faster than the local uh, magnetic speed of sound, if you want to. They're, they're super magnetosonic as they're propagating out from the sun. So there's a shock that's in front of them. And that shock emits uh, low frequency radio. And uh, as, it, as it propagates out, the frequency drops off as the plasma density decreases. And you can actually measure things like this, right? Where you see a sweep <coughs> down in frequency. And that corresponds to this plasma ball moving away from the sun. And if you can look at even lower frequencies, you can watch it propagate further and perhaps see this coronal mass ejection interact with other uh, structures in the solar wind. And that has important implications for space weather. Um, when this plasma ball reaches Earth, it can really mess up uh, communications, GPS, for example. Um, it can enhance uh, the atmospheric density temporarily. 
It can take out power grids. This has happened on more than one occasion. Um, ground currents have uh, basically blown up transformers. And then uh, transformers are not easy things to replace. So uh, when one goes, it can take some time before the power grid comes back up. There's a whole, yes? Have we seen any of these coronal mass ejections hit other planets? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Um, there was one that was tracked, I think it hit a couple of planets on its way out. I, I would have to go and find the paper on that. But the short answer is yes. There's a whole range of additional uh, science to be done at low frequencies. So I showed you those maps at the beginning, right? Here, here are sort of the best maps we have at a range of radio frequencies from uh, like 10 megahertz here up to, uh, this is I think 30 gigahertz. Um, they're not all complete for various reasons, usually observational constraints on the ground, but we don't have anything below 10 megahertz. So simply putting an observatory in space and making a map of what the galaxy looks like at these frequencies opens up a huge discovery space. We might see things that we've never seen before. That's been the case every time we've made a map of the universe at a new frequency. We see things that we didn't know about, like pulsars mm -hmm. and radio, gamma ray bursts and gamma rays. Um, the, the, there's always some new phenomena that we discover because we make a new map. So simply making a map of the galaxy sounds, yeah, so what? But things appear in these maps that we don't know about. So there's a great potential for just new discoveries. Low frequency radio also will give us a way to map the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium is the warm and sometimes coolish plasma that is between stars. So the, the whole galaxy is full of plasma. Empty space is not actually that empty. It's pretty empty, but there's, there's still plasma there and that, that matters. Um, so looking at uh, bright sources that are, being, that are filtering through this interstellar uh, medium towards us, will give us a better sense of the shape of this interstellar medium. Um, the galaxy has a magnetic field and plasmas respond to magnetic fields. So you can actually uh, map out the local magnetic field um, around the solar system by looking again at bright things propagating through the interstellar, uh, interstellar medium to the Earth. Uh, and finally, as, um, as Alan alluded to yesterday, there are potential um, signatures of uh, the, the, the dark ages of the universe at low frequencies. Um, signatures like the, the one that was detected by edges, but um, at lower frequencies that might help, um, help us understand what that edges result, uh, what, what it means. Uh, it's kind of a surprising result for those in the EOR community. There's a deeper feature than most people expected. And there's additional features that are predicted at lower frequencies that we might be able to access if we're able to uh, make extremely precise measurements at lower frequencies. So I'm not an expert on EOR, so that is all I'm going to say. If you have questions, talk to Alan Rogers. All right, all this great stuff. How do we get to it? How do we actually see these things that are so fascinating that we really want to understand? Well, we need to be above the ionosphere, right? We need to be in space. We need to have some angular resolution, right? We need, we need to be, do better than that sort of lumpy 60 degree resolution map from RA2. And we need some reasonable sensitivity. There are some things that are really bright, like Jupiter and the sun, but many of these uh, science questions require uh, more sensitivity than uh, one antenna will give you. So one way to get higher angular resolution is interferometry. Um, Alan introduced this uh, yesterday. This is a single dish. Your resolution is set by, uh, the angular resolution is set by the wavelength divided by the diameter of your collecting thing, right? So this is the Green Bank Telescope. It is very big. It is, I believe, the biggest single dish uh, that is steerable in the world. So it has, it has quite, exquisite angular resolution <coughs> at moderately high frequencies, right? If your wavelength is 10 meters, <coughs> this is 100 meters, that's not a great ratio, right? So your angular resolution takes a nosedive as you move to lower frequencies, even with very large apertures. 
Here's Arecibo, uh, which was the largest dish in the world and it's not any longer. Um, it's 300 meters, so that helps a bit, but again, if your wavelength is 10 meters, it's still not a great ratio, right? So the way that we get around this is we make sparse apertures out of many dishes, combine their signals, and have a large effective uh, aperture. Uh, in the case of the VLA, it's um, 1 to 36 kilometers, depending on the configuration. So uh, Alan, Alan showed the mathematical um, derivation for ho how interferometry really works mathematically. I like to think about interferometry like this. So imagine you have a really big mirror, right? big, beautiful, shiny mirror, and you throw a bunch of paint on it, right? You throw a bunch of paint on it, and then you only have like little bits that are shiny, right? So you lose a lot of the collecting area of that big mirror, because the paint absorbs the light coming in, but you have little bits left, and you might still be able to form a picture if you do complicated signal processing on, on what you get out of that. So interferometry is a little like that, right? So imagine that this is your big, round, dish area, but you've only got sensitivity where these dishes are. So you don't get the, the collecting area of a dish this large, but you do get the resolution. So as long as you're looking at things that are relatively bright, this really helps. And they're much easier to build um, many small telescopes than one really big one. So this is a, this is a low frequency example. The VLA operates at uh, gigahertz frequencies. How about at uh, HF frequencies? This is a, a low-far antenna. You really can't see the antenna, but um, the, the stick in the middle is supporting four wires that come down, right? And there's a ground plane underneath it. So this is a, a cross dipole, dead simple antenna. The low-far telescope puts 96 of these in a cluster, like right here. You can kind of see the little spots. Those are the ground planes, um, and then phases them up. So it's a phased array of uh, cross dipoles. So that makes a uh, larger effective area and higher resolution. But they don't stop there. They have sites all over the Netherlands. This telescope is based in the ne Netherlands. So they've got clusters of 96 like this all over the country and all across Europe, Northern Europe. So LOFAR is a low frequency telescope that is the size of better chunk of a continent. And uh, as Alan mentioned, um, you can keep going and go up to the full size of the Earth, right, and have telescopes on uh, opposite sides of the Earth that are um, used together to be a telescope that is effectively the size of the planet. So interferometry is a really powerful tool. Yeah? If you're dealing with something that's sort of time invariant, <coughs> can you get observations that are up to, you know, 2 AU apart by um, using different period times in the Earth's rotation? That's like a, like a SAR type technique <coughs> you're asking about, right? Like a synthetic aperture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, In theory, in practice, not really, because nothing is that invariant. All right. So interferometers help a lot. We can improve our angular resolution quite a bit. All we have to do now is put one up in space. Great, no problem. Spacecraft are easy, right? Um, well, okay. Let's see how many spacecraft do we need. Uh, this is from this is a table from a great review paper on low frequency radio astronomy. If you're really interested in this topic, I suggest you check it out. Um, it goes through the paper goes through a whole bunch of applications, some of which I touched on. Let's just look at the exoplanets application, right? So let's say uh, we need sensitivity 1 to 10 millijansky, right? And we're working with electrically small dipole antennas. Um, let's say we need angular resolution uh, arc second, whatever, no problem, arc minute. Uh, how many dipoles do we need? 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. That's not 10 to the 51, that's a subscript. Uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. 100,000 spacecraft to form an interferometer with enough sensitivity and resolution to detect exoplanets like the Earth. So a planet with a, a radio spectrum like the Earth at let's say five parsecs. That's a lot of spacecraft. Um, if any of you work on space related things, even one spacecraft <laughs> is a heavy lift. It is not a trivial thing to put something in space and have it work. So that's a scary number, right? 
kind of makes you wonder if this is ever going to be possible, if we're ever going to be able to make these high sensitivity, high resolution maps of the low frequency universe. So it's going to take some time, right? And we're going to have to develop uh, the best technologies available to minimize this number, right? If we can get this down by a factor of two, that would help a lot. Still, still a heavy lift, but it would help a lot. So um, I'm going to talk about some technologies that we are developing at, uh, at Haystack in collaboration with Lincoln Lab um, to help with this problem. This is a vector sensor. Um, I'm sure pretty much everyone here is familiar with uh, dipole antennas, right? Very simple piece of wire. A vector sensor is kind of a combination of several dipole antennas. So there's three dipoles. You can see these uh, wires, right? And three loop antennas. So here's three loops. Um, they share a common phase center. And they're electrically small, meaning they're not resonant antennas. You don't usually use resonant antennas at these low frequencies for astronomy purposes. Um, so you have six antennas. You have six measurements. Just so happens that the electric field, the electromagnetic field of uh, EM wave has six components, right? EX, EY, EZ, uh, BX, BY, BZ, right? So you have an equal number of measurements and variables that you're solving for. You can measure the full ele electromagnetic vector of incoming radiation using a sensor like this. So 802, right? E cross B gives you the pointing vector, where the radiation came from. So vector sensors are great tools for direction finding. Um, and not only direction finding, they also fully determine the polarization and, of course, the, the intensity of any incoming radiation. So uh, in terrestrial applications, they're used for finding bright things. Where is the guy with the radio that we don't want to have a radio, right? Um, vector sensors are great for that. But they can also perform spatially resolved imaging. This is something that I worked on as a grad student with uh, people at Lincoln and at Haystack. Um, we actually took a vector sensor model and we did simulations and we showed that a vector sensor can make a map. It can do more than just say like there's one source in that direction. So the, the six elements give you additional degrees of freedom compared to uh, a dipole antenna or a tripole, which is just three dipoles like this. Uh, and those extra degrees of freedom give you more sensitivity. It, it would be a whole other talk for me to explain, to work through the math and why that is true, but you actually get like a, a 3 dB, uh, a factor of two increase in sensitivity compared to a similar size dipole or triple. Um, we have some papers on that if you're interested, uh, but the point is a vector sensor as an element of interferometer instead of a pair of cross dipoles or a tripole is twice as sensitive. So there's your factor of two. We've knocked down the problem from uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 to 5 times 10 to the 3 times to 5 times 10 to the 4. That's, eh, that's better, right? A little bit. Uh, so anyway, we, we think this is a really promising technology for space-based low-frequency observations. Um, that vector sensor here, oops, that's not going to fit on a small spacecraft, right? If you want to make many of these, they should probably be small, so they're cheap to launch. Uh, but uh, the clever folks at Lincoln designed a vector sensor that would fit in a small <coughs> spacecraft, a CubeSat. So here's the, the stowed package. Uh, this is actually a, an older version. They have a newer design now, but this gives you the idea. So um, this is 1U 10 by 10 by 10 of a CubeSat, for those of you who are familiar with that form factor. And it deploys like this. First, um, the top pops up, increases the height by a factor of two, and then it unfurls like this. So this doesn't look like the vector sensor I just showed you, but let me show you all the elements are there. So these elements, these rectangular elements, two of them, are both loops and dipoles based on the way that they're fed. So they, they do double duty as both loop elements and dipole elements. So there's two and two. Around the outside, we've strung another loop, right? There's three loops, and then off the top, we have this monopole that gives us the third uh, dipole-like element. So now we have six elements, and ta-da, it's a vector sensor. So could we actually build something like this and have it deploy and be, be usable? Uh, well, um, 
an engineer at Lincoln named Mark Silver built this and tested the deployment. And this is one of my other favorite videos. So you can see the two stages. First it'll pop down and then unfurl. I'll let it play one more time because I love this video. So, we're going to put that on a satellite. Uh, and in fact, we have been funded to build a spacecraft and fly this thing. Um, this is called Aero, the Auroral Emission Radio Explorer. Uh, as I said, the Earth's uh, aurora emits strongly in radio, and in fact, we haven't studied it that in detail. Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions about the Earth's radio aurora. So this mission is going to fly through the aurora and use this vector sensor to localize where auroral emission is coming from in a way that really has not been done before. So it's a 3U CubeSat. We'll be in a polar orbit uh, above the peak of the ionosphere uh, with a deployable vector sensor sensitive from about 100 kilohertz up to 15 megahertz. Uh, it will measure direction of arrival of auroral emission. Uh, and it will also have some additional sensors, probably. We're, we're just starting um, defining the requirements for this mission. We, we just got funded uh, fairly recently, so uh, stay tuned. And very recently, we found out we're not flying just one of these, but we're flying two. Uh, we wrote another proposal um, called VISTA. And VISTA is a, a copy of the Aero spacecraft, and they will fly together and deploy together and perform interferometry. So we will do the first space-based interferometry with a vector sensor at HF frequencies. Um, so uh, Phil Erickson, who you've heard from twice already, is the PI for Aero. Uh, Frank Lind, who you've heard from once and we'll hear from again, is the PI for Vista. Uh, so Vista is, is one Aero plus another one equals interferometry. So we're really, really excited about these missions. Um, we'll be able to really test out this technology uh, and Hopefully that will be the first step towards a larger space-based array that can do some of these cool things that I've been talking about. Um, I, I would be remiss not to talk about other efforts happening in this area. Uh, there's a mission called Sunrise that was funded by NASA for uh, a concept <coughs> study, and I think they're still in the decision process about whether they move on to flight. Uh, but Sunrise is a <coughs> set of six CubeSats that will fly in a geostationary type orbit and uh, they're not actually connected by a net. This is uh, for illustration purposes to show that they will be acting as an interferometer uh, with six elements. Um, so Sunrise is a really exciting uh, project and you know, we, we hope that they go to flight and demonstrate the power of low frequency interferometry. Um, there have been other concepts. So I, I kind of quickly dismissed large dishes, but um, others in the community think that it might be really cool to fill up a nice round crater like this with a fairly uh, wide spacing mesh and make a radio dish out of a crater on the moon, which is kind of a, kind of a cool concept, I think. Uh, and it's something to do when we go back to the moon, right? Especially on the far side. Um, so this is a concept uh, that Greg Hallinan and others at Caltech and JPL, uh, including um, Tom Kuiper, who uh, made these slides, have been tossing around. I think it's, it's kind of a neat approach to the problem. And maybe you do this on several craters and then you have your interferometer baked into the moon. Um, and finally, there is a proposal that uh, Franklin led from Haystack to do a set of three CubeSats beyond Earth orbit at the Earth-Sun uh, L1 point. So there, there are places in the solar system uh, in a, in a three-body system where um, the gravity of the sun and the earth kind of balance out. There's a balance point. In fact, there are five of them. Um, and if you put something there, uh, it will kind of mostly stay there. There's two are uh, truly minima, so things that stay there, or put there really stay there. And the other three are saddle points. So you can do complicated orbits and mostly stay where you put things. So SHIELD is a concept to take um, small spacecraft, send them out to Earth-Sun L1, which is about a um, million and a half kilometers sunward of the Earth, uh, do interferometry with these, but also 
use HF beacons to sound the plasma, the uh, heliospheric plasma at L1 uh, and make sort of uh, the precursors to tomographic measurements of the plasma. So SHIELD was submitted to NASA and uh, will be reviewed when the government reopens, hopefully someday. Um, so we'll, we'll wait to hear and, and see if they like this concept. Um, so I will leave this up while I take questions. Here's some further reading if you're interested in any of these topics. This is a phenomenal book that gives a great overview of a lot of the science cases for low frequency observations. Um, this is the review paper that I mentioned with the, the requirements for all the various science cases in terms of angular resolution and frequency and sensitivity and so on. Um, and this is a, a report that really dives into the case for looking for and studying <coughs> exoplanetary magnetospheres. What are we really going to learn? Um, what is it going to tell us about habitability for these planets? And so on. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Yeah. So uh, NASA is looking at, hoping to eventually uh, a kind of a commercial lunar landing initiative. Have you thought about, you can, for, for payloads up to, I believe, 20 kilograms. Uh, so have you looked at uh, maybe uh, setting some of those spring tape uh, vector sensors uh, and, and for one of those opportunities? So it's something we're considering. Uh, let me repeat the question. You're, you're asking, so NASA is um, really going full steam ahead with uh, sending stuff to the moon, sending people back to the moon, putting a gateway sort of space station at the moon. Uh, and you know, are we considering putting vector sensors or other low frequency instruments at the moon? Um, it's already happened, actually. There's a, there's a radio experiment on the Chinese lander that is on the moon right now. Uh, and there's an additional radio experiment on the relay uh, for, the, for the lander. Um, I think Alan actually mentioned those yesterday. Um, there are, the, the plans for Lunar Gateway and manned missions are nebulous enough that it's, it's difficult to make concrete plans for sending instruments, but it is certainly on our radar. Um, and, and not just ours, the, the whole community is really excited to get something to the backside of the moon. Uh, so yes, uh, specific plans, not yet. Did you start populating? Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, you had the slide up of the maps at different frequencies of the sky. What do you think is more interesting to look at, like the um, the ecliptic or the poles? Uh, for me personally, or for the community at large? <laughs> I guess, like, because like with optical, usually you don't look there because there's so much dust in the way that it's hard to resolve anything. But is like, do you experience the same problem, or is like there more like interesting astrophysics happening there? Um, so if you're interested in the interstellar medium, you want to look in the plane, because uh, that's where most of it is. Uh, same if you're interested in uh, mapping magnetic fields. Um, if you're interested in extra galactic targets at low frequencies, you're going to have to look out of the plane, uh, because the plasma frequency uh, through the disk is going to make it hard to see anything that's outside of the galaxy, or even outside of your sort of local neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look out, you need to look up to the poles. Yeah. Um, for the purposes of exoplanets, we're only going to be able to look at things within 5 to 10 parsecs, so it doesn't matter. Those things are where they are. Um, yeah. uh, Steve, you had a question? Yeah, once you start populating the moon with rovers and landers, how long until you kill the advantage of bringing satellites? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Um, and people are, uh, radio astronomers are on that. Uh, there's a lot of concern that this pristine radio quiet environment won't be for very long. Um, so there are political machinations right now to try to preserve the radio environment on the far side of the moon. Whether it will work or whether other interests will win out and people don't care about low frequency radio astronomy, we'll have to wait and see. But um, especially as we start to get real lunar missions that are actually happening, call your congressperson <laughs> and ask them to keep the back of the room, back of the boon quiet. I need congressperson. Yeah. yeah. It needs to be international, of course, because of the Chinese. 
Yes, yeah. So that's that's why it's it's a very political subject because it's going to have to involve all spacefaring nations, um, and they'll have to agree that this is a valuable science laboratory. So maybe that crater idea is good for that. You know, say this crater is shielded. You know, so don't radiate down into it. Yeah, uh, that that would be a start. The problem with these very long wavelengths, though, is that uh, they diffract around everything. The back of the moon isn't even perfectly quiet because things are diffracting around the edge, right? So you, you kind of have to put a, a blanket statement down that we're not going to have radio loud things on the far side of the moon in order for it to really be a good laboratory. Charlotte? Um, so for isolated detection, you talked about how the sun isn't that bright even when it's angry, but is that true for all star types? We are, we're learning a lot about that right now. Um, many stars are much more active than the sun. The sun, it turns out, is actually a fairly quiet star, maybe quieter than average. So um, other stars are much more active, have higher radio emission, uh, but they're not so active that you end up with a 10 to the 10 contrast ratio. It's still favorable. It's still a factor of a few um, contrast. So, there are going to be some stars that are problematic. However, the fact that they're active means that they're driving emission on their planets, right? So there's lots of CMEs going off. You're throwing plasma at your magnetosphere. It's going to light up. So it is not necessarily a bad thing to be looking for exoplanetary emission around a magnetically active star. Yes? Why is it that the long wavelengths diffract around the curve? Every every wave diffracts, right? Uh, the when you're when you're at very long wavelengths, like kilometer plus, the moon doesn't look like that big of an obstacle anymore. Um, so, so you you just be, because the wavelengths are so are so long, the moon just doesn't look very big, and and things sort of wiggle around the edge. Um, it's it's nothing special about the moon or special about these frequencies. It's just uh, it's just a uh, diffraction. Uh, there's been a lot of attention paid lately uh, to protoplanetary disks. So, um, is first is like that in this wavelength range that we're talking about, and um, does that is that useful at all for looking at planets? So most of the most of the work on protoplanetary disks is uh, with ALMA, right? A ALMA is a radio interferometer working at tens to hundreds of gigahertz wavelengths. Um, and it's, it's looking at primarily thermal emission uh, from, from dust in protoplanetary disks. Because um, that dust is, is warm, but not so warm that it's uh, strongly visible in infrared, although there is infrared access. Um, I, would, I would say that we're not going to see Inter uh, protoplanetary disks and debris disks in very low frequencies. What we might understand better is um, what the star is doing magnetically to influence the development of disks. Uh, that is one of those things that is sort of swept under the rug in a lot of uh, disk simulations, although less so now. People are really starting to work on that. Um, but as far as direct imaging and, and looking for exoplanet gaps and stuff, not so much at these frequencies. Do you have a question? Yeah, regarding um, it's interferometry, I, you may have mentioned it before it came in, but you know, I, you know, interferometers is being the kind of you have a thing that slides back and forth, and it, so so how how do you when you have just a, sort of a random array of antennas, how do you turn that into how how is it made to be an interferometer? So <coughs> you um, you measure the delays. Uh, between antennas, right? So you know exactly where they are, and so you can calculate from a point in the sky right. what is the delay. I mean, the relative delay between the points. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, and then you use that to invert into an image, basically. So I'm sorry, invert what? You, in uh, so basically, you you know your delays, you, you know your oh. your locations, and then you can calculate delay by projecting in a particular direction. You right. choose the direction, right? Um, and then you end up with what are called visibilities. 
which is uh, the cross-correlation between two elements, right? So the, the, the phase difference yeah. between two elements. And you do that for all your pairs, all of your baselines. Um, and then you invert your visibilities using uh, Fourier 2D Fourier transform into an image. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I have to think about it, but basically, yes, thank you. Yeah, there's, there's extensive literature. I can uh, point you at good references if you'd like. Yes. For your six element vector source antenna, is that algorithm public source? Is it in the papers? Um, the bones of it are in the paper. Um, the code itself is not public as of today. Okay. Uh, partly because it was primarily developed by Lincoln Laboratory, so it's theirs. Um, and they may choose to make it public at some point in the future. It is, it is not as of today. But the, the underlying algorithms are, um, are public. They're, they're in the literature, and that literature is cited in our papers. So you can uh, sort of go forth and, and tinker yourself with the, the standard algorithms that we used. And you weren't held back with the CubeSat of having a limited size of the dipole. You didn't have to have any folding, did you? No. Um, because we're working with electrically small antennas, uh, they're not resonant, the, the length of the antenna is kind of a minor consideration in terms of sensitivity. It, it matters a little, but it, it is not a strong driver. Um, you, you can, to first order, say it doesn't matter at all. As, lo as long as you're not close to a resonance, can be kind of whatever. Uh, you, it, doesn't, it isn't going to work very well if it's really itty bitty tiny. Uh, so that's why we went with the you know, four meter tip to tip. That was a compromise for what we could cram into the box and what would be effective for um, good sensitivity. Your peak frequency that you showed was 20 megahertz. For? Uh, for that CubeSat. The, the deuterium lines at 327, are you doing any work there? Um, no, our, our frequency range for the vector sensor for arrow is 100 kilohertz to 15 megahertz. Um, we only go up as far as 15 megahertz so that we can uh, calibrate using ground beacons. Um, we're really interested in the part of the spectrum that you cannot observe from the ground. Uh, so no, we're not doing any work with deuterium at uh, hundreds of megahertz. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about exomoon detection. And for IO, the reason that that is visible is because of its geologic activity. So could you only detect exomoons that are geologically active? And if so, do you have any idea like what percentage of moons would be? Um, IO is the, the easiest of the Galilean moons to detect the radio signature, but it is not the only one that has a radio signature. So Europa, which is somewhat geologically active, but not skewing volcanoes all over the place, um, affects the radio emission of Jupiter as well, as does Ganymede. Um, mostly the, the modulation comes from an obstacle uh, in the flow of the Jovian magnetospheric plasma, um, kind of like the Earth and the flow of the solar wind. Uh, so it is not required that exomoons be geologically active. It is required that they be big enough and within the uh, dense plasma uh, around the planet in order to affect um, radio emission. I should also note that as of today, there are no unambiguous detections of exomoons either. There is a candidate, um, but I would not say it's reached the point where everyone fully agrees that in fact it is definitely an exomoon. So we don't, <laughs> we don't have many examples. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And um, before the rest of you wander off, um, particularly for the students around here, um, obviously we need to break down stuff a bit. But a couple of us are going to be going up to Green Building later because, um, well, one, I have a couple EME tests I want to run. And also, apparently, we've lost touch with some of our other sensors up there. So might actually be a chance to really see how some of the station works. 
Um, beyond that, um, obviously come tomorrow. Frank Lynn's going to be here to talk about radar. And next week, if you're interested in getting amateur licenses, as well as the talks, those will be on Wednesday. Is that on Wednesday? Yes. yes. Got to read up on it first. Yes, but you're MIT students. It takes you a couple hours to speak. There's also a lecture Monday, right? Yes. Um, Anthea Coster will be talking on Monday. And, and Joelle Dawson will be here earlier in the day, um, 3 p.m., I think, on um, Wednesday. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you.